welcome to part one of our video series on chromatography. In this video, we will be introducing some of the fundamental concepts associated with chromatography. During the course of this video, we will try to meet three objectives. First, we will define what chromatography actually is. Then we'll look at some of the mechanisms by which chromatography separates chemicals from one another. And finally, we'll look at some different types of chromatography uh, in order to explore how this technique can be applied in the real world. At its heart, chromatography is really just the separation of chemicals uh, based on their interactions with other materials. Now when we think back to uh, distillations as a means of separating chemicals, you'll remember that the separation was based upon the boiling points of those chemicals, not necessarily their interaction with another chemical. But if we think back to extractions as a means of separating chemicals, you'll remember that we were able to separate those chemicals based upon their differing solubilities and the two solvents being used for the extraction. For instance, a chemical that was very polar was going to be soluble in the aqueous phase, while the less polar compound would be soluble in the, in the organic phase. But you'll also remember that when we did extractions, that they weren't perfectly efficient. The extraction allowed for us to take the bulk of one material and put it in one phase and the bulk of another material in another phase. But when we carried these out in practice, we had to make sure that we did multiple extractions to ensure that we've taken as much as possible out of, the, out of one layer and into another. The beauty of chromatography is that it's kind of like doing a whole bunch of extractions uh, one after another after another very rapidly. So to illustrate this process, let's imagine that we have two different chemicals. Uh, we'll call them a red chemical and a blue chemical. Now let's assume that the red chemical is very nonpolar, something kind of greasy, uh, whereas the blue chemical is relatively polar. We would expect for the red chemical to be more soluble in systems that are nonpolar, and of course we would expect for the blue chemical to be more soluble in systems that are polar. Now, if we were to look at how these two different compounds um, would interact with a surface that is very polar, what we would notice is that the red chemical, uh, being not very interested in that surface, in other words, it's not, um, it doesn't have a very high affinity for that surface, that if we were to apply a force, uh, perhaps a strong wind or, a, or a, a flood of water, that that red chemical is going to pass right past that surface and it's not going to have very much interaction at all. In fact, if that red compound is nonpolar enough, it'll have absolutely zero interaction with that surface. The blue compound, however, when a force is applied to it, um, will show a little resistance because of its high affinity for that surface. It's going to want to stick to that surface so that even when we pass a solvent or some kind of airflow over it, it's going to want to stay in that position. Now, eventually we would expect for that blue compound to make its way towards the end of the, uh, the path there. But overall, I think we can see that the red compound is going to move much faster than the blue compound. Now think about how we could uh, exploit this in a chemical sense. If we could kind of hold a, a container on the other side of this path and, and collect the red chemical when it comes out, and then do the same thing when the blue comes out, uh, this becomes a very viable way for us to separate chemicals from one another. Now one way for us to look at this is as a chemical equilibrium. When you think about it, the chemicals that are being separated by chromatography can really exist in one of two states. Either the analyte is going to be bound to uh, the surface, uh, what we call the stationary phase, or the analyte could be dissolved in the liquid or the air that's flowing over top of that surface. Um, that's what we call our mobile phase. So really, chromatography is just a, a, an equilibrium of the analytes uh, between the stationary phase and the mobile phase. So the equilibrium for an analyte that is very polar, trying to travel across a polar surface, um, is going to lie in the direction of the analyte being bound to the stationary phase. And therefore, we would expect for that analyte uh, to travel very slowly. Why? Because it's going to spend less time in the mobile phase, which is the only thing that's actually moving.
conversely, we can say that a chemical that is nonpolar, uh, trying to um, travel across a, a polar surface, um, is going to have an equilibrium that lies towards the analyte being dissolved in the mobile phase. Uh, and because it's going to spend a significant amount of time in the mobile phase, if not all of its time in the mobile phase, uh, we would expect that that analyte will travel very quickly across the surface. Now, because different compounds will have different affinities for the mobile phase and the stationary phase, we would expect that the equilibrium will be slightly different from compound to compound. And for this reason, two compounds that are different should, in fact, separate in other words, one compound should travel across the surface faster than the other. So how does this process play out in the laboratory? Um, there are two main methods for uh, employing uh, chromatography in the laboratory. The first is a method called TLC, uh, which stands for Thin Layer Chromatography. The second is Column Chromatography. Now, Thin Layer Chromatography is typically used um, in, an, in an analytical setting. Uh, where we're trying to analyze a very small amount of material. Whereas column chromatography is typically employed uh, when we're trying to purify large quantities. So what we'll do right now is we'll start off by talking about thin layer chromatography and then we'll move on to talk about column chromatography. In thin layer chromatography, our stationary phase normally takes the, uh, the form of a white powder known as silica gel. Uh, silica gel is basically just really finely ground up glass and it's a very polar compound and what they do is they take this white powder and they bind it to a surface of some sort uh, usually they use foil or glass or uh, even plastic backing and what we do here is apply a very small amount of our sample to this plate and by dipping the bottom of the plate into a solvent capillary action will bring that solvent up through the plate, through the uh, stationary phase, and it will carry um, the chemical components of our sample up the plate according to how polar or nonpolar, or should I say, how high of an affinity they have for the stationary phase relative to the mobile phase. And what we will observe is that the chemical that has the least affinity for the stationary phase uh, will typically move higher on the plate than the one that has a stronger affinity for the stationary phase. Now the uh, distance traveled by each one of the spots can be quantified and the way we do that is by looking at the total distance that the sample could have traveled which would be the the distance literally measured in centimeters um, between the solvent front and the baseline uh, compared to uh, the distance that it actually did travel, so the distance from the baseline uh, to the sample itself or the spot that is formed at the end of the chromatography experiment. And as you can see, we can compute a value called RF, uh, which stands for retention factor. And an R a larger RF is going to indicate that a spot has moved further, whereas a smaller RF will indicate that a spot has uh, moved less. All RF values uh, should be between 0 and 1. Uh, so, for instance, an RF of 0.5 means that the spot has traveled about halfway up the plate. Okay, whereas a, an RF value of 0.75 would indicate that the spot has traveled 3 quarters of the way up the plate. Now, column chromatography is going to follow the same basic principles of TLC except the samples will be flowing down instead of up. In this case, instead of a plate, we use a, a glass tube. And we put a bed of sand at the bottom of that glass tube and then fill it up about maybe three quarters of the way with silica gel. And we add our samples to the top of the column. And by forcing liquid through the top, the chemicals will separate, again, based upon their affinity for the uh, stationary phase relative to the mobile phase except unlike TLC, we continue to push the solvent through the system, allowing us to collect each one of the individual components of the mixture uh, one by one and hopefully in their pure form. Now whether you're performing a TLC or a column chromatography, uh, you'll hear people talk about chromatography modes. Um, 
Now there are two different modes of chromatography. There's normal phase and reverse phase. In normal phase chromatography, our stationary phase is going to be polar, and our mobile phase is going to be nonpolar. So silica gel as our stationary phase would be an example of normal, normal phase chromatography. Reverse phase chromatography involves using a stationary phase that is nonpolar and a mobile phase that is polar. Uh, typically something like water or alcohols. Now the choice of whether you're going to use reverse phase chromatography or normal phase chromatography um, largely depends upon what you're trying to separate. But more often than not you'll find that the mode of uh, chromatography will be determined by experimentation. Now finally I would just like to comment um, on the different types of chromatography that are out there besides what we've talked about here in this video. Thus far, all the examples that we've looked at via TLC or, or column chromatography, normal phase, reverse phase, in all of these cases, we were performing what's called adsorption chromatography. In other words, we were, we were relying on our samples to be adsorbed onto the surface of the stationary phase. And we said that that adsorption was taking place due to um, some kind of a polar, polar, or nonpolar, nonpolar interaction. But there are other interactions that can lead to the same type of separations. For instance, uh, some people would use ion exchange resins to separate chemicals that have different charges. Um, some people have uh, stationary phases that have cavities in them of a certain size, which will uh, hold on to certain types of molecules better than others based upon their size. So there are different types of, uh, of chromatography out there. Uh, that take advantage of different types of, um, of properties. And adsorption chromatography is what we discussed in this video, but it is not the only one. In this video, we have introduced some of the most fundamental concepts associated with chromatography. Uh, we have successfully defined chromatography, uh, we've looked at the mechanism by which it operates, and we looked at some different types of chromatography. At this point, it would be in your best interest to read the textbook chapter uh, on Introduction to Chromatography uh, to make sure that you don't have any questions about uh, the material in this section. Thank you for watching this video.